I'm Matei. I'm Ethan. Hi, I'm Hannah. Hi, I'm Eve. I am Grace and we are the Manchester Festival of Nature Youth Council. The youth panel was first formed for this year's festival and we have been collaborating with the rest of the organisation team to bring you today's events. Today we will be watching the Bees Needs at You and hosting a Q&A session with the director Isaac Sterling. Isaac directed the film The Bees Needs as part of his wildlife filming masters and is really excited to share it with you today. When we spoke to Isaac, he told us that he first found a love of wildlife and bugs when he was bought a pooter as a child. A pooter is a great tool used to observe bugs and insects. Once you've watched Isaac's film, you can use the comment section to post any questions you have about bees, pollinators and wildlife filmmaking for Isaac to answer in the live stream. Enjoy the movie and don't forget to go and check out the rest of the festival. Head over to Manchester Festival of Nature Twitter to see the schedule for the rest of the day. The sound of a bumblebee is the sound of summer. The lazy hum of a meadow or buzz around garden flowers is a pleasant reminder of some of our most delightful pollinators. Bees can be found on every continent except Antarctica. Wherever there are flowering plants, you can find them. From deep jungles of cascading blooms to deserts devoid of almost all plant life. It is claimed that bees and other pollinators are responsible for every third bite of food that we eat. Without them, there would be significantly less diversity of plants, and so other species too. But our important and much-loved pollinators are faced with a growing list of threats. Modern agricultural practices of monocultured green deserts and ever-expanding concrete jungles and cities highlight but a few of these. However, as a nation of bee lovers, a number of people are acting to look after our threatened species all around the UK. But is this hive of passionate pollinator protectors doing enough to provide for all of the bees needs? Human's oldest direct interaction with bees is beekeeping, and Richard Martins has been keeping bees in Suffolk for over 50 years. He owns a small shop in his garden to provide other beekeepers with apicultural tools. And this is where I sell all my beekeeping equipment. Yeah. That's my, this is my beekeeping shop, yeah. I mean, it's there, a, a small fry, really, but. Quite a bit of stock of people want to come. Yeah. You know, make hives, frames, everything, smokers. Bees, bees of all shit. And I've got me other, me other bees, look. Come on, put your, that, put that way. <laughs> Richard also still keeps his own bees with hives in surrounding orchards and meadows. Humans have been keeping bees for around 7,000 years. As well as producing honey, more importantly, beekeepers help colonies and their billions of workers to pollinate many of our crops, trees and flowers. You have to be very gentle, because you don't want to squash bees. Again, that's, that's all full of nectar. I've got a young bee here hatching off. See him there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Come on. Oh, there he is. That's it, just come out. Yeah. That's a young bee just hatched off. I've been 50 years, well, 50, 52, 
audience. Seen a lot of changes. And especially in the last few years, I've seen a lot of things I sometimes I can't even explain to myself. Whilst Richard continues his traditional beekeeping, he is aware of the changes to the landscape surrounding him. These changes are affecting more than just his hives. All pollinator species, including bumble, solitary and honeybees, are threatened with modern farming practices. But stopping this threat isn't impossible. What we're trying to do as a business is we're trying to uh, farm in a way that doesn't push nature out. Partly my brother and myself do this, partly because it's, um, it's very dear to our hearts. With, we're third generation farmers and we are custodians of this land. You know, um, so we want to see it full of wildlife. We want to appreciate bees. Um, it, you know, I, I love just sitting down and watching the bees and I kind of think, feed the bees, feed your soul, is uh, how, how I feel about bees. I think we now have to look at food production and we now have to say, OK, you know, we're providing animal welfare. What's the next thing? What, what do we have to address? And that's where this whole sustainability, this whole ecosystem things comes in. It's about how do we farm in a way that doesn't push nature out. With the importance of the interconnectedness of nature and farming in mind, Mark is undertaking a project in which wildflowers are planted around the farm. The name of the project is A Million Bumblebees on Farm. The goal is to one day grow enough nectar to actually have, on one particular day, a million bumblebees. Mm -hmm. We've planted 35 hectares, so you're looking at about 83 football fields worth of nectar mixes. In an area dominated by expansive livestock wasteland and agricultural monocultures, there is no space for wildflowers. These nectar mixes provide welcome foraging and a range of food plants that are vital for bees. We all know there's an issue with native bumblebees. You can drive around the countryside and you can see it's an issue. It's the amount of food that's available in the countryside and around here it's very much um, barley, it's wheat, it's vegetables, it's potatoes and those fields tend to be farmed in you know, every part of that field so it's you know, where, where is the food for those that require nectar? You grow some flowers, you can see it's not an issue. You know, it's a, it's a lovely way for us to farm. We've always done this to a certain degree, but to do it on this sort of scale is it, so rewarding. So by farming with nature and its pollinators in mind, the farm is promoting both plant and bee diversity, making a space for both. To test the project's success, Mark takes sample counts around the farm, estimating how many bees are feeding on the nectar mixes. 12, 13, 14, probably look low down as well. You've got a good 14 on here. Well, you're looking at across, across this piece here, 0.9 of a hectare, somewhere in the region, 120,000 to 140,000 bumblebees feeding right now. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> it makes it all worthwhile. And where would these bees be eating? Where would they be getting food right now if this wasn't here? Where indeed? Whilst Mark is edging ever closer to his target of a million bees on his countryside farm, what about the bees in our cities and urban areas? Yeah, I've spotted one. Oh no, I've got a bumblebee by mistake. I don't want the bumblebee in there, she'll sting me. There are 275 types of bee living in the UK and London is home to a number of protected species. Mark searches for these rare bees, recording mm. their preferred habitats and food plants. Do you get it? Look, we can walk up through here. There's masses of vacuum here, there's a big, huge clump bit here. His data is used for work with some high-end clients. 
keeping bees and their habitats along central London skylines. Um, we're on a green roof, uh, 11 floors above street level. Um, it's one of the biggest green roofs in London. It is, in fact, the biggest open green space in the city of London Borough. So one of the things I do for my client here, as well as keeping the honeybees for them, is I actually manage the green roof for them. And um, what we've got is we've got uh, it's a mixture of sedum and meadow planting with um, solar, uh, solar power generation units. So it's a bi-solar rooftop. And we've got all different kinds of wildflowers growing, which the bees are foraging on. But yeah, I really enjoy coming up, so I do the habitat improvements, I do the beekeeping. What sounds like this are really useful to pollinators in urban settings where, you know, m most of the environment is built up as concrete and steel and glass. Um, and, you know, more wild areas like this on rooftops are valuable habitat mm. for pollinators. Um, and they're, 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 it's, it's a good use of a dead space that's otherwise not used for anything else. Mark's work on the green roof is restoring lost habitats which are vital for threatened bee populations. Creating a habitat like this on rooftops is one of the ways that we can help halt declines by providing not just feeding space for them but providing nesting space for them as well. We've lost 98% of our flower rich habitats in the last 100 years and there's pesticides, there's climate change, there's all these other things which are influencing bee declines but the biggest one is habitat loss and we can reverse, that reverse those trends by creating more habitat like this on rooftops and in parks and gardens. Habitat disruption in the city and beyond is responsible for the loss of 17 bee species in the last 100 years, with 56 more in serious decline. Whilst farmland and urban habitat management are helping, we must also educate our future generations on pollinator conservation, or we may lose our bees forever. Looking to the future, 11-year-old Elliot is learning about bees at Buzz Club in a museum garden in Gloucestershire. With pollinating, they, they pollinate the flowers and if, if it wasn't because of them, we might not be around. Elliot has been coming here to learn about bees for three years. So I've gone to Buzz Club and they, they teach people about bees and what they do and how they do it and if you want bees yourself to get honey or just to pollinate flowers next to you, how you do it. We are. They're very important because they pollinate, because we need, we need flowers for the nature and the food chain goes up eventually to us. But Elliot is aware of the trouble that our pollinators are in. He is hopeful though, for the future of bees. It's quite sad that we're doing most of the devastation. But if Buzz Club carries on, we, we could save thousands of millions of bees' lives and we could regrow the population to get bigger and bigger. So with bee lovers of the future preparing to assist in slowing pollinator decline, it is now up to all of us to learn to help them more. Shall we say thank you to the bees? Thank you. For sharing some honey? Thank you. Work is already going on to protect our bees, but with all they do for us, it really is in our interests to provide for all the bees' needs.
Hello, I'm Isaac. I hope you enjoyed that film that I've uh, I produced as part of my master's degree. So that was, in case you missed the beginning, called The Bee's Needs. And I'm really excited to have that being shown as part of Action Con for Conservation's um, bit in the Manchester Festival of Nature. I don't know if you've managed to see anything else that's been going on this weekend, but it's, uh, it's really exciting to have some things going on here. So now I'm going to do a quick Q&A about um, my film and about anything else that you might have questions on, especially pollinators. Uh, obviously in making that film I learned a lot about pollinators and as a general enthusiast for insects and bees and really uh, all animals, uh, I'd like to talk about some pollinators with you. So if you've got any questions then please send them over on the Menti page which you can find in the description below. Um, as the film was going there we did have a few questions on. Uh, the first one that came through was about the camera that I was using and um, how I got sort of the stability in it and how I managed to get the shots that I had. I was very lucky because, as I say, it was part of my master's degree in Bristol at uh, the University of West England. Um, and we had access to really quite good cameras, so it was lucky that I could use the tripods and the sort of camera that allows stabilisation in the edit afterwards to get the shots that we had. But um, in truth, I just spent a lot and lot and lot of hours in fields trying to film bees and making them look nice. Um, the next question, which is quite a good one actually, is do bees sleep? Um, I think it's probably something that a lot of people don't think about because most of the time when we're outside, especially in the summertime when bees are about, you can see them buzzing around all the time and as the film says, they are really this sort of, they're the sound of summer, aren't they? But bees do actually sleep, and I think they sleep for quite a long time. I've read some things that say they can sleep for... I'm just checking some of my book. I've got hundreds of bee books all around me. Um, bees can sleep for five to eight hours a day, apparently. Um, but obviously, during the night time in the summer, uh, it depends how light it is, or how dark it is, rather, through the duration of the night. So I think when it's not sunny and bees can't find their way around and there aren't, the flowers aren't open up... Um, then they go and sleep in their hives or in their holes or in their trees or wherever they're sleeping. And sometimes you do actually find them sleeping on flowers as well. So if ever you go up um, to a field late at night or early in the morning, you might see in between the flower petals a bee sleeping. Um, and you'll know if it's sleeping or not because it's antennae, which are normally upright like this, <laughs> uh, rest down like that. So you'll know if a bee is asleep. Um, next question was, uh, how can I look after bees in my own garden? Well, obviously, bees are pollinators, so that means they need to eat pollen and nectar, and that's why we always see them on flowers. They land on flowers, they land on plants, and that's what they need to do to survive. So by having lots of plants, that's the easiest way to look after bees, and having good plants that have got lots of rich pollen in them and flowers. So native plants, that bees that are native to our country that will be flying around, would be landing on and looking for, and also um, not spraying them with loads of pesticides or if perhaps you've got an allotment next door and you want to keep the slugs off or keep other in, um, insect pests off, don't spray loads of pesticides and put insect repellents on there because obviously that's going to keep the bees away. The other important thing to remember is that bees do need to drink as well. So if you leave out a little dish of water and make sure that if you do leave out a little dish of water you put some stones in it so the bees can land on it and then drink from uh, that water there then that's a really good way of attracting them because especially in the summertime when bees are flying around when it's been so hot like it has lately uh, it's really important that they have something to drink as well um, <laughs> a, quick, a quick question uh, what are my favourite bees? Um, there are actually 275 give or take a few species uh, bees species in the UK so there's a lot more than just honeybees which people think of and the sort of bumblebees that we see buzzing around the big fluffy ones um, I would say that my favourite bee species is a type of bumblebee called um, Bombus humilis, which is called uh, brown-banded carder bee. And the reason I like that bee so much is because, first, I'll try and find it in my book. First of all, it's, it's very cute. It's like a big brown fluffy one. And second of all, it's quite rare. And on some of my best filming days and some of my best bee mission days, I've actually found one of them. And every time I've been so excited... Um, so I'm trying to talk whilst also founding my card to be. I might have to look for this one in a minute, I think. Just because I want to get through these questions because there's some really good questions coming through. Um, so next one, are there many green rooftops in Castlefield, Manchester, Central Zone? Um, I'm not very local. I'm from Bristol. Actually, I'm from Suffolk originally. I live in Bristol now and the filming that I did was in London where there are quite a few green roofs. 
I would imagine that in Manchester there are green roofs of sorts. I should think that um, there are a lot of different places that bees can be hiding out. And I think a lot of people will probably have balconies and uh, rooftop gardens and things like that where there will be flowers and even small things that people consider weeds like dandelions. The seeds can fly so far, especially you know when, you, when, you, when you've got a dandelion puff and you blow it and all the seeds come out in the summer winds. They will land on a rooftop and as long as there's a little bit of water and even a little bit of soil or mud or even frankly like something like bird poo if there's a lot of bird poo somewhere then a dandelion could grow from that which eventually a bee might get lost flying up high land on that and then um well pollinate it really it's important um though to remember that if you do have green spaces in dense urban cities to leave a little bit of space out for bees and all the other pollinators as well which i'm kind of ignoring but there are so many different insect species that pollinate and that are so important so if you have even even if you don't have um, a balcony or a terrace or certainly not a garden you might just have like a little um, bit of window ledge that sticks out of your window like I've got in my flat here in Bristol and I've just put a few potted plants out so that if any, ever a bee does get lost flying around up high and it feels it's, it's hungry or uh, wants a little bit of nectar then it can land itself on my windowsill and enjoy whatever flowers I've got in flower at the time there. Um, so next question how did you come across this topic and learn about its importance? Um, well, as part of my master's degree, uh, which was all about wildlife filmmaking, I, I want to be a wildlife filmmaker. I do actually currently work making films for uh, the One Show on BBC One for an independent company. Um, but I've always wanted to talk about wildlife and how important it is to people and how important it is to the world as well. And I think that it's all very well and good a lot of the time. You know, we watch we watch TV and we see cheetahs and, and gorillas and elephants and sharks. Well, I mean, sharks are awesome. All these animals are really awesome. But actually, something that all of us can see, I don't know where everyone is watching from, but I would guarantee that anyone that was watching, unless they were in Antarctica, the only place where there aren't bees, if they went outside at some point in the day and it wasn't freezing cold, then a bee would land on a flower near them or a fly or even a butterfly might fly past and I think it's so easy to overlook these really important things. And so when I was thinking about what film I wanted to make, I thought, what can we celebrate that everyone knows a little bit about and that everybody needs to know some more about because of its importance? So I thought, well, bees and pollination, because really, if we didn't have pollinators, then, as the video said, we wouldn't have um, almost a third of all our food crops and it would be massively expensive to try and keep food alone going, let alone the rest of the environmental uh, problems that would start happening if we lost plants and flowers. Um, a really good question. How do bees navigate? Uh, well, carrying on from what I was saying just then about all uh, the environment and, and habitats and, and all the different flowers that bees use, they do actually, like we would, map a, uh, map a route through our garden. We would see there was a bunch of yellow flowers there and a bunch of red flowers here, and, and they make a visual memory of it. Uh, that's their primary mode of flying around, especially when they're scouting for something. They will fly around and look for particular plants or flowers or fields or even trees, like landmarks that they can remember to work around, uh, work their way around with. But they also have a really clever way of navigating, which is that they can work out in relation to where they're flying, where the sun is. So if they fly out from their hive and it's quite early in the morning and the sun is at a sort of low angle behind them, then they will know that that was the angle they flew from their hive from. So to get back to their hive, they can turn around and fly back, keeping the sun at that angle behind them, um, which is a really cool way of doing it. And then honeybees, which we did talk about very briefly, are they're the ones that make our honey and the beekeepers keep, not bumblebees or all the other solitary bees or the other bee species there are. Um, they will actually communicate with each other by they, they, they land in their hive and they see all the other bees that are going to be going out and collecting pollen and nectar and visiting flowers and they do a thing called a waggle dance which is a really really cool way of uh, communicating which it would be like if we started dancing to say like there's food over um, in, the sh in Sainsbury's down the road and what they do is depending on the amount of wing buzzes they do and jiggles of their abdomen they do and actually the head direction they move um, other bees can see which direction the uh, food is and how far away it is, which is a, it's, it's so cool and so advanced. And I think, as I was saying earlier, we sometimes underestimate and take for granted some of our most common species, which are the bees. And, you know, they're, they're dancing to each other to say where food is. Um, 
moving on from honeybees as well, uh, mo uh, sorry, continuing with honeybees and talking about uh, them communicating with each other, there's a good question saying, do bees mind having their honey taken? Well, first thing I'd like to point out is that of the 275 bee species in the UK, and um, I think there's about 16,000 species of bees worldwide, uh, there really aren't many bees that actually make honey in the mass scale that we expect them to. So, for example, uh, in the UK, as I say, there's one species of bee, the honey bee, which is those little brown, uh, they're not fluffy, they're sort of brown and they've got dark orangey brown yellow stripes along their back. Um, they don't mind us taking their honey as long as it's taken responsibly. So beekeepers, by giving them a really good hive and a good house, um, the bees have a safe place to store lots and lots of honey and then also the beekeepers give them other beneficial things to keep them safe so if uh, there aren't many flowers out and about for example they can supply some honey from the previous year or provide some other form of energy for the bees and they've always given them water as well so the bees are actually in hives are really successful and as such make a bit too much honey um, to keep them going so normally bees make honey so that in the winter time when there are no flowers out they've got a source of honey to keep their hive going through the winter and the cold months if they make loads of that, then that's great for them normally. But obviously, if a beekeeper has made sure that they've made loads of that, so we can take a little bit of away, a bit of it away, and then have it on our toast or cereal or yogurt or however you have your honey, um, then the bees really don't mind, and beekeepers will never do something to upset their bees. Um, so moving on from honeybees and bees, we're going just back to the film quickly. Uh, what are the main challenges that I faced when making the film? Um, talking about some of the some of the images that I got and uh, what does the future hold for me as a filmmaker. Definitely the main challenge was finding uh, the people that uh, I filmed in that film. I don't know uh, if you sort of were thinking about the people or just the bees or just the story of the importance of bees in general but um, finding all those awesome people that are actually doing so much to help bees was it was it was quite a challenge because there are to choose which people were doing the right thing because there's obviously there's hundreds of beekeepers in the UK and there's a lot of people that have got gardens and that are looking after particular uh, habitats in order to keep bees and pollinators happy so finding them and making sure that they wanted to be filmed and that I could film them and do justice to the work they're doing was probably the hardest bit in terms of future I don't know, I would love to make more films about bees and insects, but I would take any wildlife opportunity that came my way. Um, obviously, something like David Attenborough working on one of his big blue chip films, which is just purely wildlife, would be really cool. But I think telling the story of how people are interacting with wildlife and the conservation concerns that stem from that would probably be a more worthwhile approach for certainly the next few years for me. Um, lots of questions coming in about how can... Uh, we help bees and what's the best plant for bees and, and that sort of thing. So as I say, native plants are always the best um, and that's good for not just honeybees but all the different species that we have of, of bees in the UK and different pollinators like butterflies. Um, so yeah, I think we'll probably be wrapping up with this question actually so I'll, I'll try and go into it a little bit more. Depending on your habitat, uh, weeds like dandelions, like I was saying, they grow everywhere, poppies, they grow everywhere. But then there are other species as well, plant species like um, echiums, which are called buglosses, um, and uh, a lot of tree species as well are really, really good sources of pollen and nectar for bees. So making sure that you have not just um, a lot of plants, but also a good mix of plants. You don't can't just have one or the other because it would be boring for bees just to be eating the same meal over and over again. So having lots of different plants and making sure that they're native ones and that they are bee friendly. Normally they would say if they're bee friendly or not. Um, it's worth a look, uh, worth having keeping that in mind. So perhaps if you're thinking about planting up for some bees or maybe just even putting a tiny bit of wild space in your garden where you can start attracting them more, then just do a little bit of research online and say what are the best plants for bees or what plants are natural to the Manchester area or uh, something like that because it, it really does differ and obviously keeping whatever uh, plants you can there for bees will be a great thing. Anyway, I think that's probably it for questions. Sorry I didn't manage to get through them all. There's some really good things coming through and I probably uh, have waffled on a little bit, but I hope you've enjoyed that Q&A and I hope you've enjoyed learning about all the different bees and and and, uh, and habitats and all, all those sort of things. Manchester Festival of Nature is going to be doing loads of awesome stuff through the rest of the day, so make sure you check it out on their Twitter page, which is at Lanks Wildlife. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Go out and see some bees and butterflies if you can. And stay safe, everyone. Keep 
uh, keep being interested in nature. Bye-bye.